Thank you for joining us tonight in Melbourne, uh, early in the morning in Rome, uh, I guess late afternoon in Kyoto. And Hugo, I'm not sure where you are, but <laughs> I guess maybe you're you're lurking in Europe somewhere. I am in Rome, yes, yes. Okay, good. So um, this is a kind of a almost a three continent Zoom meeting one way or another and um, organized by myself, I should have said I'm Dan Hill, I'm the director of the Melbourne School of Design. Uh, I'm just going to let Matteo into the room if I can. Um, at the University of Melbourne and the Melbourne School of Design is the graduate school in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. And uh, I'm organized this with my friend and colleague Yuichiro Takeuchi at Sony Computer Science Labs in Kyoto. Say hello, Yuichiro. Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, Yuichiro from uh, I, I work in the Kyoto branch of Sony Computer Science Lab. Great, thank you. And uh, welcome Matteo as well, who's just joined from Sony CS. Hi, sorry for the for being late. No problem. So before I get going, um, in Australia and in, in Melbourne, uh, we acknowledge the country that we're on before we start any kind of public meeting or any kind of meeting at all increasingly. So I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet here in Melbourne, which is the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, that is, which is where the university's main campus sits and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so, this will be the format today. I'm just going to go through this uh, table of contents a little bit, just so you know. We'll do introductions in a moment, and just very quickly, if we can just say who we are and where you're from, really, um, because uh, a bunch of us will be making presentations, and it'll become clear who you are <laughs> at that point. So let's just quickly whip around the uh, Zoom room and say who we are. And then Yuichiro is going to do a framing piece, you know, what, what uh, Sony Computer Science Labs is interested in and what they do. I'll do the same around Melbourne School of Design, and then we'll hear from our invited guests, uh, Hannah Gould, Vittorio Loreto, and Rory Hyde. And then we'll have a quick break, and then we'll move into a discussion, which will be an open discussion, which Yuichiro and I will try our best to facilitate. I would say, um, please take notes as people are speaking We'll save all of the questions and comments for the discussion part just to get that going. So if you know Hannah or Vittorio says something particularly interesting, then just note that down or remember it and then bring it up later rather than stopping the presentations if that's okay. And I would say that this is uh, the first workshop or discussion of three. And uh, so over the next month or so, we'll do a second and a third and we'll be recording these and putting them online as well as um, having discussions about what we what we're talking about. So it's kind of working in progress as we go. Uh, just to say where Rory and I are coming from, just to place you a bit, um, we are in the Japanese room and garden at, at the University of Melbourne, which seems a little bit uh, ironic to be talking to people who are actually in Kyoto. <laughs> um, we have this uh, amazing room though, designed by Professor Shigeru Yura in the mid 1960s when he was invited to the University of Melbourne by the um, Professor Brian Lewis at the time, and he, he did a lot of interesting work in Australia and um, yeah, and left us with this wonderful room and garden. And when we rebuilt the building here about 10 years ago for a new building for the architecture building and planning faculty, we reconstructed the entire room and rebuilt it in the, in the new building. So this in a way is a room from 1965 um, and it has a, a whole series of Japanese um, uh, architectural and landscape design features in it. It's a funny kind of hybrid in a, in a, in a way actually of Australian and Japanese things. Um, and I would say it's also certainly not set up for Zoom meetings, <laughs> which were not foreseen in 1965, but it, it somehow does a good job. So anyway, um, I'll now just move on to some introductions. And so I'll, I'll just quickly get myself out of the way. As I said, I'm Professor Dan Hill. I'm a designer and urbanist by background. My original degree was in computer science and then I did an urban sociology masters. So I have a funny mixture of technical and arts and social sciences going on. And then I practiced as a designer for all of my career, both digital design originally for those first 15 years or so, and then um, urban design, urban strategy and working with cities and buildings for the, the second part. Uh, and so um, that's me. I'll 
pass over to you, Achiro. You briefly said hello, but please say something else if you'd like. Uh, yeah, so hi, uh, I'm Yuichiro Takeuchi. And I'm a researcher at Sony CSO Kyoto. And uh, my background is in computer science. I got my PhD from the University of Tokyo, but I also got a master's degree from the, at the Harvard's Graduate School of Design, which is an architecture and urban design school. So I try to uh, work in this kind of interdisciplinary area between like computer science and architecture and urban design. Great. And I'm, right now I'm joined from Kyoto. You know, we have this Japanese style room in the lab. Yeah, you have, you have actually a, a, a literally <laughs> Japanese room, whereas ours is like that. <laughs> yeah. as that um, uh, homage to a Japanese room. Um, Hannah, would you like to go next? To just introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's uh, Hannah Gould. I am work as a research fellow um, in the School of Anthropology, School of Social Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Um, Trained as a cultural anthropologist, but find myself increasingly working a lot with uh, human computer interaction specialists um, and design, um, particularly around my work to do with religion and death, um, which I'll explore and, and introduce you to a little bit more. That's great. Thank you. And um, uh, Vittorio. Yes, and thanks a lot. So my name is Vittorio Loreto. I'm a physicist by training, so degree and um, PhD. I'm currently professor at Sapienza University of Rome in the physics department. But then since uh, five years and something, actually, I'm directing the CSL lab in Paris. And very recently, actually, we opened a new lab in Rome. Um, it will be the, the fourth one of the CSL, CSL series. Uh, by background, I'm a theoretical physicist, but then I got slowly interested in complexity science and all the interdisciplinary applications. And then, of course, I'm in urbanism and cities, and this kind of complexity are very interesting to me. And uh, so that's why, I mean, we brought I mean, this kind of activities also within, uh, within CSL. There was already a branch devoted to sustainability, but I mean, city was... Uh, at least, I mean, in Europe, I mean, of course, Yuichiro has been working on this for years on the on the Japan side, but in Europe, I mean, this activity was not yet uh, yet there. Okay. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Rory. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rory Hyde. I am Associate Professor in Architecture, Curatorial Design and Practice here at the University of Melbourne in the Melbourne School of Design. I'm sitting in the same room as Dan upstairs in our Japanese room. Um, my research looks at uh, suburbs, at housing, at um, forms of architecture, modes of practice, uh, and ones which can be more social, more inclusive. Um, and before coming to the university, I worked in a museum um, of design as a curator. So today I'm going to talk, um, and you'll, I'll be presenting later about some museum <coughs> work, more curatorial focused um, things and, and the future of the museum. Yeah. Great, thank you. And we have a couple of guests joining us um, from CSL as well. You, would you like to introduce yourself, uh, Matteo and Hugo? Uh, sure. Um, I am uh, Matteo Bruno. I'm working as a researcher in uh, uh, Sony CSL Rome and in urban sustainability and mobility. And uh, by training, I'm a mathematician, but my PhD was in complex systems complex networks uh, applications specifically. And so I have uh, an experience in many, many kind of applications of complex systems. And now uh, our research goes in the way of uh, studying and understanding urban structure and mobility for uh, sustainability and inclusivity. Great. Okay, um, so um, I'm Igor, I am a researcher uh, in it's on CSL uh, since 1st January, so not a long time ago. Uh, uh, my background is in physics, so my, my degree and my PhD was in physics. Uh, but um, my research was more focused on, on, on complex systems, but complex systems is still a very broad area. And, and actually, I work it with... Uh, different social aspects of urban life, like violence, poverty, and try to connect them with mobility, looking to the perspective of scaling uh, laws in, in, in cities. So to, how to understand how these things change when you look to different sides of cities. 
and 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 and, and that's it I think this yeah is... <laughs> oh that's great well um so I always try and intend to get as kind of multidisciplinary a group as possible or to get a sort of like transdisciplinary condition <laughs> emerging in the discussion and I think um we've achieved that so far already because we have uh you know strong complexity science foundation here from the Rome end of things and then we have anthropologists and architects and whatever I am <laughs> um so yeah a mul multiples of these things so fantastic I'm really happy that we I think we'll have an interesting discussion if we can find some kind of crossover points so to get things going I'm gonna hand over to Yuichiro just to uh, present a kind of a framing piece from your point of view Yuichiro for about 10 minutes or so if that's okay okay uh let me share my screen so so yeah i prepared some slides uh, i wanted to give a quick introduction to like uh sewing csl and uh like who we are and what we do and also um you know like i have some slides about uh, my own like research interests as well but i thought maybe like, i can first start by like uh, talking about how, how this whole thing like how this workshop came about and uh, I'm not sure where to start, but like uh, this is casual, so I, I can kind of meander, right? And uh, so I've known Dan for quite a bit of time now. Uh, I think the first time we met in person was, I think, in 2018. There was a conference in, uh, in, in at Tokyo, and I was one of the organizers, and uh, Dan was the keynote speaker for the conference. So I think that was when we first met in person. But I knew about Dan since uh, uh, much earlier than that, because uh, Dan is, has been keeping this blog called The City of Sound. He has very, very like well written blog, and he's keeping it for like a, I don't know how many years, I since eternity, and uh, twenty years, so, <laughs> twenty years. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I I knew about this uh, work and uh, from his blog, and uh, I think so. I, I don't remember when was the first time I stumbled upon uh, across the dance blog. It was many many years ago, but I think nowadays we can. It's easy to find people who are interested in both computer science and also urbanism, but. I think at that time, you know, many years ago, when I first found out about Dan's blog, I think to me it was—he seemed like one of the very few people in the world who were really like uh, thinking hard and like uh, writing extensively about uh, the implications of digital technologies on urbanism. And so, yeah, so throughout the years, I, I think Dan's work has been very like uh, inspirational and influential uh, to my own work. And uh, I don't know where, where I'm going with this, but I, I think about a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> you should change yeah, about the a year ago, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think I got this like uh, uh, Dan told me that um, he's moving to Melbourne, and I think that was about the time when we started talking about possible collaborations between because uh, Melbourne and Japan, like we roughly exist in the same time zone, right? So there's maybe like one hour or two, two hour difference depending on season, but we roughly uh, are in the same time zone. So I think we started talking about like uh, possible collaborations, and uh, over time. Um, this idea popped up that we'll have this, we'll hold this workshop as the first step. Mm. So the hope is that this is the first step that will lead to something like uh, maybe long term or like a long scale, a uh, large scale. So mm. uh, more like a full fledged collaboration between the two institutions. So yeah. yeah, so that's how the workshop came about. And yeah, I have some slides about. I'm not sure if I have to introduce Sony, but I mean, Sony is a company that was uh, founded in 1946, and. Uh, uh, actually, I, I think uh, if you look back at the history of a lot of Japanese companies, especially well-known companies, uh, a lot of the companies come, come from this thing called Zaibatsu, which are these like large conglomerates that used to have this immense power in the old days. But actually, Sony is an exception. Sony is a, a startup. So it was founded by a bunch of people who just wanted to start something new. And uh, it started out as a very small company uh, right after World War II. But now it has grown into this like a very large and multinational corporation that employs over 100,000 uh, people worldwide. And uh, the small pictures on the right side, these are some examples of uh, Sony's products that we've been selling over the years. And I think if you look back at Sony's history, one thing you notice is that um, we are not a company that's been selling the same thing throughout its history. So we uh, constantly enter new markets and we like constantly um, like launch new product lines and new product divisions. So that, that kind of like that sense of like constant change and evolution, I think that's something that characterizes Sony as a company. And I work in a division called Sony CSL, and CSL stands for Sony uh, Computer Science Lab. And this is an R&D division within Sony that was founded in 1988 to focus on computer science research. And I think Vittorio said at the beginning, but uh, so yeah, we have four branches now. 
So at first we only had the Tokyo office, but now we have four branches in Tokyo, Paris, Kyoto, and Rome. And uh, there's one like joke that we often tell ourselves uh, within the company that uh, Sony CSO, we have this unofficial policy that we're only going to open new labs in cities that have, have like a great food. So, you know, the latest addition is Rome. And uh, so that perfectly fits the bill. And, and uh, at Sony CSL, we have this kind of a freewheeling culture. So one thing I really appreciate about this lab working here as a researcher is that nobody tells you what to do. So we have the freedom to follow our own like uh, intellectual curiosity. And uh, so like uh, uh, come up with their own research ideas. And lately we do have like, uh, I'm seeing a lot of researchers who are interested in urbanism within Sony CSL not just in Kyoto and uh, there's obviously Victoria and there's several guys in Tokyo, but um, this is not really a coordinated effort. It's just like a, people just happen to like organically become interested in urbanism. So, and yeah, so uh, that's yeah Sony CSL and I work in the Kyoto branch of Sony CSL. And nowadays I spend most of my time working on this project called the Wikitopia project. And uh, the goal of the project is to create this, uh, realize a future cities that can be uh, edited and improved by citizens. Kind of like how uh, Wikipedia, the encyclopedia is edited by volunteers. And so we, we are trying to create, um, kind of bring this, uh, like a relatively democratic mode of production that you see in the online world, whether it's Wikipedia or uh, open source software like Linux. And we're trying to bring that mode of production to uh, physical real world urban uh, design. And uh, when I put it this way, it might seem like very far-fetched and sci-fi, but uh, in reality, uh, you know, like a citizen-led urbanism, like urban design in the hands of citizens, that's something that exists in various forms uh, around the world. So the picture on the left shows the uh, parklet in San Francisco. These are like small parks that are planned and proposed and uh, or like designed and yeah, like built and maintained by citizens, citizen groups. So this kind of uh, citizen-led activities, like urban design activities, uh, exist in various forms around the world, including Japan, of course. And so what, what we're trying to do, what the question we're asking within the Wikitopia project is, how can we use new technologies to uh, facilitate or further accelerate this kind of practice? So like, for example, how can we uh, lower the hurdles towards citizen, citizen participation, for example? Or how can we increase the scale of artifacts that are designed, that can be designed and built by citizens? Or um, how can we promote this kind of spontaneous urban design while at the same time uh, avoiding like major conflicts between citizens and so on. And so these, uh, this slide shows several of the projects that uh, we're actually working on in our lab. And so we're, we've been doing a lot of work on 3D printing, for example. So, um, and I think there are a lot of like research groups and companies nowadays that are printing things like benches or bridges or small houses. But our focus is more on printing things like gardens or parks or uh, various forms of urban nature. And also we are like de developing a social network that's uh, dedicated to urbanism. So uh, a platform where people can share their ideas and opinions about their neighborhoods. And also we've been doing uh, some work on augmented reality. So um, we are trying to create fun uh, fundamental technologies to realize the high quality augmented reality in urban environments. So, uh, so yeah, to let people like re visualize the outcomes of proposed like, changes and improvements to the, their neighborhoods. And also this is a uh, very early stage at this moment, but we're trying to uh, create our own decision-making platform. So I think nowadays, like uh, there's this increasing awareness that uh, conventional like commercial social media, like Twitter or Facebook, they're not like ideal platforms if you want to have something like civil discourse or um, consensus building. And so we're trying to build a, a, like a platform from the ground up that's focused on um, facilitating the, you know, constructive decision making. And so this is the last slide. And uh, uh, yeah, so as I said at the beginning, my hope is for this workshop series is that this will lead to a long term collaborations between uh, these two institutions. And uh, I hope this uh, workshop will be productive for all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yuchiro. Fantastic. Um, already, I scribbled down a few things for us to pick up later, for sure. Um, so but I mean, in the interest of time, I'll just also then uh, I'll get my presentation out of the way and then we can move on to the, you know, the participants. So um, I, I think I'll echo a few of the things you sure said about the hope for the collaboration. Let's see how we go. Uh, there's definitely a shared interest both sides here. So that's really good. And thank you, Chido, for, um, uh, for reaching out and uh, connecting us together. And I'm really happy to work with this on you. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about 
uh, I guess our, our work as a school and, and my work, my background within that, um, just again, so you position some of the work here. And I've, I've tried to think of some research questions, essentially. And my background as a designer, as I said, is, you know, for a long time, I've worked on these kinds of things. <laughs> I, I can't really say who this was for, but um, imagine kind of urban interactions in numerous ways, the kind of things that Yuichiro was talking about, how would citizens use technology, but not in uh, the typical smart city ways, perhaps, but ways that are centered around citizens' desires and needs and building out of those things. Um, and unusually for me, I'm just going to read a couple of bits of words from this. Uh, usually I just show pictures, as you'll see. But uh, you, Chiron and I have been working on a kind of a bit of background text or a manifesto for this. And I just wanted to hit some key points here to frame the discussion a bit. This is, but this is very much in draft. So and I, I, I should really point out it's not Sony's point of view or anything. It's, you know, it's, it's come mainly from you, Chiro, and I, and, and this last bit mainly from me, I guess, just to own it. So what I'm trying to say at the start here is cities are really about culture and community and commerce, and that they kind of come together as a kind of a tangle of systems around natural systems, traditionally, you know, rivers and ports and coastlines and things. And so they're about this kind of entanglement of culture and nature, and that's therefore super local, but they're also part of these now planetary scale flows. And we know that's what, why they're incredibly complex. Um, we've said the word complex already about 15 times. I'm sure we'll say it more. Um, the second paragraph is really making the point that um, sometimes you confuse the means with the ends or like the point of cities. And we get caught on thinking about buildings and infrastructures and stuff as if they are the point. But actually, I wanted to say that culture is the point of cities <laughs> or community is the point of cities. Or you might argue commerce, which might be a form of culture, I guess. But that's the real point of cities and buildings and infrastructures and technologies are enablers of those things. We need them to make them happen. We need the building to have this conversation in, but they're not really the point. And the smart city movement traditionally, the you know, technology plus the cities has often made this mistake of focusing on the infrastructures or the buildings, as opposed to the life of the city or the culture. And so, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about a city would be if we thought about the intelligence and creativity and resourcefulness of the inhabitants human and otherwise, so I mean also natural inhabitants one way or another, and how adaptive urban technologies can help tune those systems um, rather than inhibiting them. So that's part of a bit of a framing, I guess. Uh, another very quick way of saying that would be this quote from Cedric Price in 1966, a British architect who said, technology is the answer, but what was the question? And we have a tendency to jump on the technology uh, as the interesting thing here, but of course the really interesting thing is the question behind that. What, are we, what kind of city are we trying to make? Uh, what is, as Yuichiro said, you know, what, how, do, how does a community um, decide and discuss and converse and collaborate? And then we can talk about technologies once we have a kind of a philosophical or a social setting for that question. So here are some possible threads to take forward and I've got about five of these, so I'll move through them quite quickly. So one thing we're interested in is, um, given what I said about you know, culture and society being the key thing, the idea of social infrastructures. And perhaps the neighborhood scale is particularly interesting here. And I know Vittorio might touch on this later with this idea of 15 minute kind of organizations of things or thereabouts, but this kind of neighborhood scale that we can begin to look at social infrastructures there. And as a key text for me is Eric Klinenberg's book there. He's a sociologist, but you know, the, the idea of the, the culture and the social and how we think of those things. So not just library as a place for books as it used to be, but library as a kind of living room for the community and the neighborhood. This is one in uh, Yantai in China. Energy becoming microgrids and neighborhood scale energy generation through to because of renewables and batteries. But then that means actually that they're social things. As in, if I live next door to Hannah and she needs to use the energy, how do we decide to share the energy between us in a block? That's something we haven't had to think about for quite a long time. So there's a, a social overlay onto the electrons, if you like, and the technology isn't so much the point there, but the way that we decide what to do with it. Um, uh, buses are really community centers, whether they're autonomous shuttles like this one in Finland or with, with drivers, right? So how do they work as social spaces and what do they do within the neighborhood scale? This is the Bogota care system, which is one of the most interesting projects around at the moment. How do they build care centers in these concentrations of public transport plus library plus a certain level of density? Enables them actually to work with 
um, women who otherwise are stuck at home doing unpaid labor. And they, they, this, this program in Bogota is about releasing actually women from that kind of unpaid labor and enabling them to pursue their lives in the city. And uh, that, of course, needs a physical space and a, space, a social space as well as a political space to happen. Um, this is a lovely project in Stockholm, which was really a, a park, but designed for birds as much as it was for people. So it's kind of a, a nest for things like these ducks, but it's also designed for kids to run around in or other people to sit in or whatever. Uh, this is a project by a Melbourne-based artist, Linda Tegg, which was a modular meadow system, also in a car park, interestingly. Car parks are a good site for this stuff, as Ewan Shiro pointed out with his parklets. So that's actually not about parking, but also about biodiversity and culture and social fabric. Um, housing, when done at a community scale, as a cooperative, like this one in Melbourne, of course, there are many of these in Japan, is also about generating social fabric. And then, of course, um, Sento, which is a traditional Japanese community neighborhood bathhouse. We also have those in Melbourne, by the way. There's the Melbourne Japanese bathhouse in Collingwood down the road. So how do they work as part of a binding the neighborhood together? And that also maps onto bathing cultures in Sweden and Finland and many other cultures. So all of those things are kind of um, in this huge list that I once made with a bunch of students in Oslo about these kind of social infrastructures and they're really crucial to the way that neighborhoods work. How do we think about those things? What are the important ones, the important building blocks there? Um, and how do we value them? Because it's not just about a bathhouse isn't just about going to get washed. That's the utilitarian function, but it's also about culture and society. So I like this quote from Rebecca Solner about the street, which is about errand and epiphany, as in the, the magic of the street, as well as the jobs that are to be done there. Um, Japan has a really interesting set of kind of conditions around streets that Kisho Kurakawa pointed out. Um, multiple boundaries conflicting in the same space, very complex understanding of public, private, shared, as words don't really mean the same thing in Japan that they do in somewhere like Melbourne. So it would be interesting to compare and contrast those. And it's coming to streets, I worked with the artist and musician Brian Eno on uh, some street projects in Sweden, and he came up with some principles we might want to think about for these kinds of design um, questions. And so I'll share those afterwards. Second one would be like, how do we design for this sense of emergence, adaptation, circularity, participation, this ongoing flow of the city? And again, Japan has a set of urban conditions to find around that, like these books here, Emergent Tokyo, Digesting Metabolism, uh, Open Architecture for the People, Darko Radovich's book, Small Tokyo. You know, there are very interesting uh, urban conditions there that are complexity at the scale of streets and complexity at the scale of neighborhoods. So this gets us into participative systems and the street project we did in Sweden had the prime minister involved, that's him on the left, um, but also school kids. And we let the school kids design their own streets in this sense and made kits for them, a bit like the things that Yuichiro was talking about, where you have citizens editing their own city here. So the, the school children were the architects of their own street in this case. And this, as with Yuichiro showed, like a parklet model is a fantastic um, kit of parts that enables people to build adaptable structures in places that otherwise are set in stone literally for decades. So we, we particularly built them in wood, actually, um, because that's a very interesting adaptable material. And I think you see things like Kawadoko in Kyoto. Yuchiro knows these very well, these kind of temporary incursions into the city that are built in the summer and then taken away again. So this means that the street has a kind of a disposition, as Keller Easterling calls it, this kind of arrangement enables citizens to approach it. And I'm interested in how you would make a disposition for care then. This is in uh, Kurame in Tokyo. Um, how do people look after their own streets, actually? And I call this the one minute city, uh, Victoria, you might like that, which is the immediate urban environment, you know, which you have an intimate relationship with and you can actually change. Whereas 15 minute city is more of a spatial organization at a much larger scale. And as Yuchiro pointed out when we were chatting beforehand, there are traditions around the world, of course, in building these adaptable ways that you say temples rebuilt every, every 20 years for 800 years, it means that they last a very long time. And there are ways of using circular materials as part of that, which is also uh, an interesting challenge in Japan, which otherwise has a kind of a scrap and build culture often around its buildings. Um, so now we need to think, how do we do that in a way that's sustainable? working at these different kind of layers. This is Stuart Brand's idea, pace layers, layers of change, how to th move things move quickly and slowly. 
So the third one means is about then the decision-making cultures. This is building on Yuichiro's prompt about how do citizens decide? And again, there is a set of um, interesting Japanese angles there, and of course, uh, other ones, Western ones or Northern ones. Um, so the street stuff was really a platform for asking questions in public with the public. That's what it was about. And there are technologies that I've used in the past here, like these augmented reality platforms that enable citizens to understand maybe what's happening in their street. This is a project we did with Ericsson, uh, which enables citizens to kind of see what's proposed in a space, test ideas, to comment on them, to make their own suggestions and so on. You, you know this stuff very well, Yuchiro, and uh, I think this is kind of one interesting line for us. That project turned into one in UN Habitat in, in Johannesburg, and um, I turned the sound down, but um, imagine very excited, happy students here, <laughs> realizing that they could edit their own city in this respect using these technologies to sketch with. Well, I've also done that in a very lo-fi way in places like Sheffield. And so when I say technology, we might want to think about just pen and paper as well. That's also fine, right? So. Uh, that's an interesting overlay. And then what kind of value does that generate? Uh, what, you know, all of those little in interventions like the parklets that you and Chiro talked about have this complex web of outcomes around them, around social fabric, around biodiversity, around environment and so on. So we need to understand that. And that means that we need to maybe think about who's involved at these different scales of decision-making. At the one minute city end, you can be super participative potentially or in certain things. So if we look at, let's say, religion, you can have a shrine at the scale of the street, and that can be looked after by the people on the street or the, or the church um, or the chapel right there. At the 60-minute city, you might have a major cathedral. You know, and that isn't something that citizens tend to build themselves, and you don't just go in and look after it. You know, there are, that's an official process. Same with football. You can organize a game of football at the street. We don't need to bother the mayor about that. We can get on with it, you know. <laughs> But uh, at the 60 minute city scale, you're talking about a national stadium. That's a slow process. You can't get it wrong. It's quite risky. So you have a representative decision making culture around it, which is quite different to a participative one. So coming to the end, um, there's an idea about technology here, which I just hinted at, which is also it's more complex than just high tech or digital. And we're interested also in nature-based technologies. And I, I like this quote from the science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin, who describes technology as the active human interface with the material world. So that's a very broad definition of technology, effectively the tools that we make to interact with the world around us. So within that, we could might look at water and say, this is a technology. This is a, a water processing plant in Dakar funded by the Gates Foundation. It takes in dirty water from sewage and turns it into drinking water. So that's a good thing. And we would recognize that as technology, I guess. But the East Kolkata wetlands is also a technology. It's built by people for a certain um, outcome or set of outcomes. It doesn't happen naturally, although it uses nature as its materials. You'll see the one on the left, the Omni processor does 14 tons of sewage a day. The one on the right, the East Kolkata wetlands does 700 million tons of sewage a day, going through that system and turning it into clean water through a series of natural filtration plants. But it also produces 16,000 tons of rice, 80,000 jobs, biodiversity. It protects the city from storms and so on. I'd say this is a technology too. <laughs> But we often tend to think about the one on the left and value that, and the one on the right is being destroyed and turned into um, property development. <laughs> so we, we have to really think carefully about the definition of technology here at this point. And in Australia, we have um, maybe, we can learn a lot from indigenous knowledge systems in 60,000 years, 65,000 years at least, of understanding that nature and technology and culture are the same thing. This is a, an eel farm, which is roughly 6,000 years old at least in Victoria here in outside Melbourne, which still works. You know, it's an operating system in a sense, but it's also deeply cultural. So finally then, uh, one thing I think with Japan and Australia have in common is a, a slowing birth rate and a slowing population growth, just like pretty much most of the world. And this is maybe the last thing I would say is a kind of a starting point for research. Uh, Danny Dorling, the Oxford University professor wrote this book, The Slowdown about this. Um, so Japan is obviously in the lead of this, perhaps. Uh, countries like Sweden and Finland and others are also slowing down. Italy, likewise, without migration, Italy will be half the size by the end of the century, you know, 30 million people, which is hard to imagine that that's what the population growth looks like. 
So um, that's the same in China, it's the same in Australia, it's the same in America, this is this kind of slowdown and it's not much talked about because of our tendencies to talk about growth. But there might be something interesting here of what we can learn again on a sort of Japanese axis. This is uh, Tokyo basically slowing down. This graph shows population growth slowing down overall, but also in the suburbs and the center equally. So Tokyo is kind of static now as a condition, as are most of the other cities in Japan, which is interesting then because it's kind of refining itself in the same plot going over and over again and um, could do this in very, very beautiful and sustainable ways or, or not. <laughs> and it's a big choice we have. So Dorling would say that the slowdown gives us time to worry about one another and less about what we um, receive in the future. It gives us time to question things. It's not a utopia or anything. And obviously, if we don't approach this in the right way, it could be a complete disaster unless we recalibrate ideas around what society is about. But it may equally be something that enables us to build these patterns of care for each other and care for the environment, um, because we literally might have the time to do so, and we, as well as the need to do so. So that's my last slide. Um, these social and cultural infrastructures, infrastructures I talked about really could be about this kind of beauty and dignity of shared things in everyday life. And I'm interested in how does design and technology approach those kinds of things to enable these kind of richer understandings of technology and culture and place. That was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> but there's, um, there's kind of five big research questions uh, I guess we could dig into um, as we go. So I'm going to move back into the agenda now that you Chira, and I have kind of got our framing stuff out of the way. And I'd like to ask Hannah Gould, if that's OK, to talk about her research for about 15 minutes or so. We have plenty of time. So um, over to you, Hannah, to share your thoughts with us. Yes, thank you. And um, look, I will try and be short and sweet. Um, let me share this. Just give me a moment. Just on. Sorry, I'm coming to you from a funeral home of all places, but the reason for that will become infinitely clear in a moment. Um, so thank you, Dan. Thank you, um, everyone, for this in you know uh, wonderful uh, invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my research. Um, and my goal really here is just to throw a lot of things out there to uh, explain some of the things that drive the work I do, the kind of research I do, um, and hopefully leave, leave a lot of um, space for questions um, and points of connection that we can find together. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about what I've written here as kind of ritual technology, and I have somewhat... Uh, unconventionally or I'm uncomfortably translating as scenario technology. Um, we'll see how that definition goes <laughs> for it, um, but it's something I've been working around and thinking about for a number of years here now. Um, I must admit, Dan, looking at your slides as well, they remind me that we probably go to every single of the same cafe in Tokyo. <laughs> um, I recognise Seoul's Coffee. I recognise a lot of those bars that you're at. So um, it's been a really interesting presentation so far. Anyway, so um, what do I do? I'm a cultural anthropologist, um, which basically means I study the diversity and the unity of humans. So I look at what brings us together um, and what you know makes us, distinguishes us, what brings us apart. Um, I do that specifically in three areas, uh, material culture, religion, and death. So when I'm talking about material culture, I'm specifically really influenced in this approach by um, my supervisor at Oxford, Inge Daniels, and her work on the Japanese home and attention to the everyday materiality of every of, of life um, in the domestic sphere, but then beyond. And also, I suppose, this idea of technology is a really long durée approach. So technology in my field, everything from, you know, the book, the printed word, the Bible, through to AI, robotics, um, those kind of transformations in technological sphere. Um, in terms of religion, I'm really focused on looking at East Asian religions, Buddhism, animism, and spirituality. And then finally, a lot of my work revolves around this idea of death, um, both death of humans, but also what I would consider the death or decay or decline of non-humans um, and how they all intersect. So some of you might recognize here, this is Peppa-san, 
on the right. Um, when I was at Index in Tokyo, um, I was happy enough to witness Pepper in a new role as a Buddhist priest, um, which was, it was like, let's be honest here, it was a bit of a publicity stunt um, that this company put together in order to, to kind of demonstrate their, their products, but was very much about, you know, fulfilling the gap that's emerging in ritual specialists in Japan. Could we have robotics um, fill that gap? What is it about Japanese religion or spirituality? What is it about Buddhism that allows a robot to play that role um, that maybe they couldn't play in Australia or elsewhere? So I sometimes summarize my research as the stuff of death and the death of stuff. Um, depending on who I'm talking to, um, but I'm really interested in those kind of cycles of materiality, decay, rebirth and change. So the current work I'm doing is on transnational futures of death care in the Asia Pacific. So I work across Japan, Korea, um, now also Indonesia, Australia, looking at how death and dying and systems of care um, and indeed urban infrastructures for caring for the dead and dying um, have exchanges between these cultures and also as part of the death tech research team here at the University of Melbourne, which is a research team with close to 10 people now from uh, multiple different disciplines, um, including HCI, um, history and philosophy of science, anthropology, who work on these questions of death technology and social change. So my background, for some of you, this will be very, if you know anything about Japan, uh, this will be an interesting uh, set of research uh, Photographs. So this is my background, my PhD work was very much about um, the systems of care of the dead um, in Japan and how they have transformed um, in response to a number of disruptions. So looking particularly at the Buddhist industry for Buddhist altars and graves, I actually worked at a Buddhist Japanese funeral home and a Buddhist uh, altar company for many months. Um, and, you know, starting to think about how these are really religious technologies, religious technologies that we have developed for caring for the dead and how they are being transformed. Um, you'll note that um, Yuichiro had the photo of uh, Aibo, the dog, in the history of Sono Sony. Uh, this is actually the uh, funeral that I went for these dogs uh, in Tokyo that I attended as part of this kind of idea that um, technologies have lives and, and, you know, in the same way, technologies might also have deaths. Um, and certain technologies require certain things from us, right? So particularly in Japan, there's a history of funerary rites for objects. So it's not just the life and death of humans, but also the life and death of objects or cityscapes or uh, material cultures and how we might respond to them. Um, this is obviously the work that I had my background in in my PhD and since then have moved on to how these kind of questions might more broadly be transforming around the world. So here we have a number of examples of new technologies that are emerging around the care of the dead, both in Australia and Europe. Some of these photos come from COVID. Um, I'm sure many of you will recognize Animal Crossing, <laughs> graves, these kind of technologies and new digital spaces for memorialization, but also very much physical technologies for handling the body, whether they be uh, made of fungi, whether they be um, the transformation of the body in the soil or whether they be very low tech um, and bringing the community together to cremate the body um, together. So these are the kind of intersections or questions that I've been looking at um, so far. Uh, so I suppose in doing this work I really draw on anthropological methods of participant observation, interviews, co-design. So I do a lot of co-design work but I also through participant observation actually work and live in funeral homes um, and kind of try and learn the skills of people um, that I'm studying. So I do deeply embedded work for multiple months, trying to gain their skills. So whether that's learning how to cremate somebody, whether that's learning how to give Buddhist rites for the dead, um, that kind of really ethnographic long-term research. And a lot of my research, I suppose, and where I've kind of come to collaborate a lot with HCI researchers and technologists is around this idea of mediation theory and seeing mediation is actually the key thing that religion does, right? In making the transcendent knowable and transmittable, um, you know, religion is a technology in order in the same way that, you know, music or Walkman's is a technology. Um, but for me, I suppose what's most interesting to me, what's been a provocation of a lot of my research is actually what happens when this all breaks down? <laughs> what happens when this stops up? 
right? So what happens when the te technology breaks or what happens when people choose to get rid of that technology? And what are the implications for that, particularly if it is a religious technology, as opposed to maybe something we're less sentimental about? Um, so this kind of emerged somewhat naturally in my research, but was also prompted um, for me by a conversation I was having with a, a Buddhist monk um, when I was, you know, studying death and dying. And um, I should have, sorry, I should have provided the English translation here, but I, maybe I can talk you through it, which was he actually kind of talked to me that actually, you know, the afterlife in Japan is actually best explained as a cloud computing system. Um, and this was how he kind of, this was his cool way of explaining Buddhism to young people in Japan to try and get them interested in, in this kind of system for carrying the dead, where you had this kind of um, synchronicity between the temple, uh, the ancestral altar and the grave that gets synced up. And so the spirit kind of gets uploaded into these different technologies, which are regularly synced through the maintenance of the priest. Um, and then there's this kind of data conversion from the uh, funeral ceremony that, that allows the kind of deceased to go to the pure land and to be in heaven. So in some ways, you know, this idea of ritual as a technology is not just one that's a, a framing or theory that we're imposing on people. It's actually very much how a lot of Buddhist monks were using, um, were explaining their own kind of worldviews to people um, and in a way that, would allow them hopefully to connect and kind of transform those technologies and make new technologies. So um, I've done a lot of work previously in the past and some of you might know Uryu Daisuke who's at um, Todai Tokyo University um, in the HCI. He does a lot of work particularly on thanosensitive design. So looking at how we might use dec um, dig digital technologies um, to update or renovate or transform um, Kind of traditional Buddhist technologies and being really sensitive to those kind of different worldviews and religious worldviews that are imposed in those. So whether they be um, what we have here, which is kind of a digital interface for the traditional Buddhist altar, or uh, whether it be things like um, allowing AR, um, out of, you know, augmented reality um, resonances to be embedded in the city so that you can walk through a city and kind of hear the story of ghosts um, from the past telling you stories as you as you walk through or other kind of interventions in terms particularly of sensory interfaces so learning how to digitize and modernize sensory interfaces in lots of different technologies and I suppose this has implications for what we've discussed more broadly in terms of the urban I suppose setting but also in terms of the shared challenges we face um, particularly around death and dying the area that I'm interested in um, there's a lot of overlaps here with Australia and, and Japan, some more uh, emphasised on either ageing population, secularisation, um, kind of economic decline. Um, it was always described to me particularly in this analogy to the tax system, which is that in the same way that we have less young people to pay taxes to look after the elderly, um, a similar problem could be said of Japanese religion, where there are less young alive people to look after the ancestors and make sure that they're cared for. So the same kind of systems of obligation and care that exist between generations also extend between the living and the dead. And I want to make the point here, Dan, that you've talked about the slowdown um, as a kind of overall social framing, but it's interesting to think that actually for a lot of people working in death and dying, demographic realities of an aging population actually mean a ramp up for death care. Mm. Um, so we are facing what has been called peak death um, or the grey wave, the silver tsunami, whatever <laughs> you want to call it, but it's a, a period of history in which more people will be dying than ever before as this kind of post World War II baby boomer generation gets older and then moves towards death you know, dying or prolonged dwindling and decline. Um, and that that slowdown, I suppose, in many spheres actually corresponds with a ramp up in, in, in kind of our need to care for the dead and also to care for the bereaved in a way that we haven't necessarily addressed so far and that our current systems don't work on. And so, you know, I started working then on thinking about, for those who don't know, this is a kind of traditional format of a, a Japanese um, cemetery. Um, and these spaces now really butt up against many urban developments. I mean, this is such high, you know, very expensive property these days in Tokyo and in, in, in Kyoto where these um, 
urban cemeteries find themselves, how might we reinvent those spaces so that we can find room, not just for the living in the city, but also room for the dead in the future of our city. Um, not just their natural inhabitants, but also potentially the supernatural inhabitants of a city. Um, and I note, Dan, I didn't think I saw cemeteries on your list, actually, that you um, generated with students, which is just really interesting to me because we always forget the dead. <laughs> um, I think, was, so, I think it was there. <laughs> was it there? I, came out. I was like scanning desperately. Yeah. Um, but alternative spaces and alternative ways of remaking um, how we store the dead. And I've just got a huge range here. These are not only about the storage of ashes and the kind of ways of accessing them that are either condensed or high rised or um, in some cases here we have mass graves, collective graves, or we have intensely personal graves in terms of, you know, jewellery that you wear containing the dead but also thinking about these then spaces as multi-use spaces that can be sites to not only care for the dead but also for the dying or the aging or to find connection through grief and loss mm -hmm. so this is a lot of what my work looks at now and how these kind of I suppose architectural designing challenges intersect with people's ideas of where the dead should be in the city um but on a final note, I will say that I'm not only, I suppose, interested in innovation and renovation and new ideas and new technologies, but what also really fascinates me is what we do with the old technologies, right? So what we do with the kind of, as I said, technologies that no one cares for, um, objects that break. And so um, I've recently been in, this is in Fukuyama, um, just in the mountains kind of in between Hiroshima and Okoyama. This is um, Ohaka no Haka the grave of the graves. So this is a site that contains apparent approximately 70,000 unwanted and disused gravestones um, in the mountainside. Um, and they're hidden away very much, right? Because there's kind of a real sense of dis-ease that um, around the existence of these objects. I mean, in, in many ways, this location should not exist. <laughs> this is this is this is graves that have no owner. These are people, these are dead that have no one to come and care for them. Um, indeed, my my mother-in-law and my people that I was visiting here, they wouldn't get out of the car because this this terrified them, this this site like freaked mm -hmm. them out so much that this existed. But um so I'm interested, I suppose, not only in how we reinvent traditions and re reinvent religious rituals, but actually what do we do with the kind of the remains, the leftovers of traditions that we no longer want to think about and perhaps cannot find space for, perhaps even traditions and deaths that we're a bit ashamed of, that we haven't kept up the maintenance of. Mm. So thinking about these spaces and, and kind of <laughs> these incredibly spooky, beautiful environments and what space we might find for them. Mm. That was the long run ritual technology. It's what I'm really interested in. I hope there's many connections that we can find together. This is my favorite ritual technology, by the way. This is the um, brush sweep at my local crematorium. Um, right. Possibly the most important technology they have. But um, yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for the opportunity to present. I'm really interested in what kind of overlaps we can find. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks so much. That was so interesting. Um, yeah, loads of challenging questions, evocative ideas, lots lots of lovely observations as well. And um, I think some really interesting threads that we can start pulling together uh, there. So thank you, thank you so much and fantastic that it's sort of so well placed in Japan as well. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right, I checked, cemeteries was not in my list and <laughs> I blame the students. Blame the students. <laughs> No, I was really hoping it wasn't so I could make a point. But <laughs> no, no, exactly. You're totally busted. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember doing then a talk with them about Recompose, which is something we've talked about a bit before, you know, the sort of effectively sort of natural burial processes um, of returning mm. bodies to the ground through fungi and other means. And so mm. th that's super interesting. Also, I, uh, yeah, without getting into observations too much, I'll just save that for later. But what do we do also about the space required? I mean, this is a, it's a very um, complex question or a very utilitarian one or both. <laughs> it can so, be both, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And maybe another interesting overlap might be this question of um, indigenous technologies and sort of that idea of culture and spirituality and technology and utility all at the same time. Which, mm. Of course, with the Ainu in Japan also has a tradition. So anyway. 
I'll shut up. Um, Vittorio, over to you. Here we are. I mean, fascinating, Anna. Actually, I, I just recorded, I mean, a lot of things, but I was really struck by uploading the ancestors, which yeah. is really <laughs> an, an interesting concept. Okay, let me let me share uh, my slides. I guess they are here. Can you see anything? Yep. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, I guess I, I don't need to say I mean much about CSR because we should already uh, said a lot, except that we reached the, the galaxy of CSR in the last uh, couple of years with this uh, Kyoto lab, which is right now, and uh, and Rome lab in 2021. Uh, just a few words about the, the Rome initiative. Um, so by the way, first, this is a set of uh, topics we we cover between Rome and uh, and uh, Paris. Of course, there are overlaps. Uh, traditionally, Paris was born with uh, with language technologies and and music. That is, of course, I mean evolved uh, over time. And now we have a lot of stuff about um, sustainability, in particular agriculture, uh, micro farming, robotics. Um, and on the Rome side, actually, we cover mainly three three aspects. One is about sustainable cities, and I will say something about this uh, today. But then there are two big chapters, which are one is about uh, what we call the infosphere. So all the, the, the ecosystem, I mean, connected to the way in which we produce and consume and diffuse information. Uh, and of course, all the pathologies connected to, to it, uh, and sort of the healing procedures for this kind of uh, ecosystem. And then there's a big chapter about augmenting creativity, which means, I mean, how technology can actually uh, improve, I mean, human creativity, not substituting human creativity, but somehow supporting, I mean, and expanding somehow the, 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 the set of uh, possibilities for, for, for humans. Um, so, Rome was actually uh, born with the with the idea of focusing on having an impact on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, of course, I mean we couldn't do this uh, in in Paris. Somehow we had to change a bit in order to launch new activities. And the whole point about Rome is actually try to to get your hand dirty. I mean in concrete settings and try to come up with new possible scenarios. And we'll discuss more about scenarios in a, in a, in a second. Uh, scenarios in the sense of what would happen if I do this, uh, and of course this would be done in collaboration with with policymakers and, and stakeholders. And uh, one of the main aim is try to also mobilize the public and private sectors to explore, uh, uh, let's say, I mean, new market and new business models, but not specifically about money, because I mean, uh, uh, a new market can be a new application area for a specific technology. It's not off the shelf technology, but somehow a technology which could be adopted in a completely different different context and now there is a lot of discussion about having a big project i mean focusing on on, on africa uh by the way i mean the, the lab in rome is already a public private enterprise because we signed an agreement with a public institution is the research institution entitled to enrico fermi who was a nobel prize in physics in back in the 30s of last century so we are also in this beautiful building i mean if you come to rome at some point we could probably will one of the next meeting in this uh in this uh, in this place uh so it's a it's a difficult challenge because i mean putting together the interest of a corporation even though csl is no profit but still is within within sony with a with a public institution is not easy so we're trying to run this experiment i hope it'll you work uh, nicely. Um, so about sustainable cities. So I, I would say a few words. I mean, and give a few examples. Uh, perhaps then, I mean, tell me when I'm I don't know three four minutes away from the deadline, and I will stop. But you will see. I mean, I'm trying to give a few examples, but uh, the general picture will be clear. I mean, immediately after. So we spoke already about SDGs. This is a is a general group of people now working on this. This is growing, and of course, we're trying to include as much uh, backgrounds as possible. But uh, we are not so rich, I mean, as we saw today in this in this workshop. So I guess this workshop is quite interesting also from, from this uh, perspective. Um, so we actually work at three main scales. And I basically realized that, uh, I mean, we don't cover the scale that uh, Dan, Yuichiro, and Anna cover so far, which is a scale, I mean, much closer to, to, to human beings. Of course, I mean, human beings for us are represented by the traces they, they, they leave. Uh, 
but the, the typical scale at which we work, I mean, is, uh, is a one in which we don't focus on single individuals. We start working actually also with uh, architects and designers in Rome, I mean, focusing at this scale, but I guess this workshop could be interesting also from this perspective. So we go from the macro scale and the macro scale means, I mean, looking at cities from the socioeconomic point of view, socioeconomic indicators and try to see how the cities are now is evolving on longer or medium time scales. So it's also looking at the kind of products of the city, which could be patents, could be new technologies, could be scientific scientific results. Uh, then there is the micro city, which is the, the scale of uh, actual mobility of people, could be walking mobility or could be transportation mobility, but still, I mean, in the way in which we look at the way in which people, individual people, uh, use the space and somehow wander in the, in the, in their environment. Um, then, I mean, there is a backboard, which is a smart city. I don't, I mean, I, I agree with Dan that, uh, the city is not smart. It's not the technology making the city smart or people perhaps I mean, making the city smart, but this is just to say that we are using Sony technologies. And this is a collaboration with Sony semiconductor solutions. There is this new intelligent cameras of Sony privacy preserving. They were trying to use it, installing in several areas in Rome for different applications. I mean, if I have time, I mean, I would give you an example of what we are trying to achieve there. Uh, one of the key points is uh, is about the scenarios. So we constructed this platform, which we named "What If." Uh, it's self-explanatory. So the idea is not only, I mean, looking at the present. So somehow having a clever or a somehow unusual representation of the reality is something which would be uh, invisible to the naked eye, but we try to make visible. So this would be the representation of the present. But that's, I guess, I mean, the important point then would be, I mean, what next? So what happens if uh, we do this in the city, which uh, uh, somehow, I mean, it's not the same as forecasting because forecasting would be, I mean, what would be the most likely evolution of the system, the system if I don't do anything. Scenarios would be more, I mean, I want to be proactive on the, my environment. I want to take specific actions, but also I want to evaluate a priori what would be the, the, the most likely impact of those, uh, of those actions. Uh, and there are many examples in that direction. So one of the the, the main one, probably also the, the most recent one, is about the 15 million city, which, okay, we, we mentioned, I mean, and then expanded this also, I mean, to lower scale, one minute to a higher scale to 60, 60 minutes. But I guess uh, with all the light and shadows, I guess the, the concept of the 15 minute city somehow put the spotlight again on the, on the main question, how we uh, structure our cities. I mean, so somehow the point that the way in which cities are structured is not uh, any more satisfactory. And then perhaps we should rethink, I mean, the way in which we organize our, our space. Then whether it's 15 minutes or 20 or anything, I mean, and of course, I mean, there are many, uh, many, many challenges behind 15 minutes city because we can have a very non-inclusive city still satisfying the, the, the requirement of uh, uh, proximity. Uh, and there are many issues concerning the, the quality and the then mentioned value at some point. So the value of the kind of point of interest you, you, you reach within 15 minutes, because you can have a perfectly segregated city with high hand and perfect services reachable within 15 minutes. And then, I mean, a very shitty services still within 15 minutes in a different, in a different area. Uh, so we constructed this platform. So I, I, I mean, I have a lot of slides, but uh, don't worry. I mean, I'm trying to just to convey the main, the main, the main message. Um, so these are the typical representations that we make of uh, the 15 minute cities or the different cities. We we recently computed the last night, actually, thanks to to Igor, Matteo, and and Bruno. Uh, the, the, the 15 minutes representation for, for Melbourne. Uh, the, 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 the platform is online, so you can actually browse, I mean, and explore a bit. Uh, you can explore much more than what you see here, but the, here the representation is the one in which in each specific spot you have a color, and the more the color is bluish, the more, I mean, the city is within 15 minutes, which means actually that the all the services included in the main basket defined for the 15 minute city are reachable by walking or biking within 15 minutes. And the reddish colors are about 15 minutes. So you can see that in many cases, I mean, you can identify a center for cities. I mean, it's very rare to identify more than one 
center. So at the idea of the 15 million city will go in the direction of the polycentric polycentric city. Uh, but you can explore much more than this because you can actually click on each specific, uh, uh, yes, like in this case, you have this rather representation. Uh, you can click on this specific spot hexagon in this case and see for each specific category of uh, of services i mean how much you are compliant with this idea the 15 minutes and of course also in this case you can uh, create scenarios uh, in the sense that you can actually add new pois new bike lanes i mean new infrastructure in the city and try to see how this would change the overall 15 minute structure of the city and i guess this is quite close to what Uchiro was saying and perhaps i mean you could also Think about, I mean, possible experiments in that directions with local communities in specific areas of uh, chosen chosen cities. Um, we also try to 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 move in the direction of combining this uh, sort of uh, fifteen minutesness uh, of the city with uh, an evaluation of the quality of services, and we are actually using a, a framework. I don't have time, I mean, to to describe in details, which actually is. Uh, it's useful to 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 compute what we call the fitness of a specific spot. Okay, it is actually using data about the location of the POIs, the point of interest, and the and the actual geographical locations to see how this this combined. And you can see that there is a very strong uh, correlation between the fitness, okay, of specific spots, and also the fifteen minusness of this uh, this spot. So we're trying to look at the city from different angles. And as you can imagine, I mean, our approach is always combining on the one hand data, which are the primary source of uh, information. And then, of course, I mean, all the data science tools, but also complexity science tools in terms of modeling and understanding which kind of uh, uh, quantities we should look at. And then, of course, a lot of machine learning and uh, and AI to, to, to figure out a new way to, to look at the data. Um, if you now move, I mean, to, to public transportation, another platform which actually we built i mean first was city crone and the idea was sort of monitoring i mean how far you can get in a certain number of minutes in a city using public transportation and uh, for instance these are different representations now the color i mean the, 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 the more red is the color of the bis is the average velocity to reach a specific spot in the city or to leave a specific spot in the city and again uh you, you can identify i mean city city centers and you can actually see i mean how unequal i mean could be could be cities from the perspective of accessibility because city centers uh, and in rome in particular at the center actually you can identify the the three metro lines i mean creating this sort of star shaped uh, uh red structure um, but then as soon as you go off of the, the beaten track, you see that the accessibility degrades, and probably this is forcing people to use, I mean, private cars and other kind of uh, transportation means. Um, also, in this case, actually, you can create scenarios. So, for instance, we have uh, a little game in which you can uh, you have a little budget, uh, you can construct a new metro line, and then try to see, I mean, how this metro line incorporates in the existing uh the existing timetable and see i mean how much this improves accessibility not only along the line you just constructed but also i mean away from it because of course carefully uh, designing the metro line you can actually try to cross other lines and so exploit the existing network uh, already and of course you can also knock off existing structures and try to see i mean in this what if perspective what would happen if this specific transportation mean or technology would not uh, would not be there um very very quickly so we are also trying to to see uh to quantify the impact of uh, of infrastructures and i very appreciated today i mean that you mentioned that infrastructure is not only metal structure or <laughs> silicon based structure but i mean the technology could be any kind of technology as we as we saw and in this case i mean the question we we pose actually okay suppose now you open a new metro line i mean what would be the socioeconomic impact of this in terms of new companies new jobs new 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 um, new, new budget uh, available and uh, and of course i mean the idea here would be to expand this it's just a preliminary work we are collaborating with the local chambers of commerce to get data about uh, the, the companies and they are very much interested in having predicting algorithms in terms of okay we are planning to do this kind of big works in the city and you know in rome in 2025 there will be the big jubilee 
and there are not less than 300 big works already planned. And so the idea would be what would be the likely impact of this of these works. I mean, on the on the socioeconomic fabric. Um, okay, I go quickly. This you can just see. I mean, now the the number of enterprises uh, uh, increases. Uh, differentially with respect to what would be expected without the, 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 the metro line. And uh, one interesting point, which we couldn't actually explain, I mean, carefully, is that actually, even though actually the number of enterprises increases, the diversity is decreasing, which is sort of counterintuitive, okay? Uh, and still we don't have, a, I mean, a reasonable model for, for, uh, for this evidence. Um, we do a lot of stuff about uh, the, the technological production in cities. In this case, we look at cities from the lens of patents uh, production, and we exploit them I in this framework. Originally developed actually at the, 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 the research center hosting us in, uh, in Rome. And this is a, is a framework already adopted by the European Commission and the World Bank to evaluate in the first place countries, okay, looking at the export markets, so which kind of products are exported by this specific country to another country. Um, and this is a way, I mean, to actually uh, evaluate the capabilities of specific countries. And we, 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 we scale down this at the level of uh, metropolitan areas, looking at the, at, the, at the technological products as witnessed by the, by the patents, codes, uh, in specific metropolitan uh, areas. And you can do a lot of stuff out of this. You can actually map cities in this uh, on, the, on, the, on the left, actually. There is this uh, 2D representation in which you have the GDP on the y-axis and the fitness, which will be this new quantities for cities. And you can see in time, I mean, the specific path of CD towards, I mean, progress or, or, or somehow, I mean, uh, high-end welfare. And you see, for instance, all the all the Chinese and Korean cities, I mean, really catching up, I mean, and growing very, very, very fast. You can actually look at the sort of trajectories in this space of, of you can look at this from the point of view of countries, but now it, it is uh, from the perspective of, of, of cities. I don't know whether there are Australian cities here, probably they're not represented yet, but we have we have them. Uh, ah, yes, this is a, it's a sort of how the ranking uh, of cities in terms of technology production is changing over the last the last 20, 20, 20 years. And uh, if I don't go wrong, there is Melbourne, I mean, in the top 30 in the, the left, which would be in the 90s. But then if you go on on time, you see that most of the cities are basically Chinese and Korean, actually in the top 30s, okay? Which means I'm not, I mean, Melbourne is not bad, but in terms of growth, actually China and Korea are basically overwhelming. Um, okay, this is, uh, how much time do I have then? I guess it's already over, right? Uh, maybe another, a couple of minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Now I just close with this actually because we 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 also try to combine art and science in uh, in uh, in our lab. And this was uh, was an artistic project. Uh, so we have a few European uh, programs devoted to 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 this and we typically start having artists in residence focusing on specific uh, questions like uh, I mean sustainable cities. And in this case, this was a project about tracking tracking waste. With with uh, with GPS sensors, okay, just sort of more refined technologies, and and the idea is to look. I mean, from the the moment in which you leave, I mean, your your waste on the bin, what is the actual trajectory of this uh, of this weight? And you can see that can be very local. I mean, uh, sometimes, but also very unlocal. I mean, most of the time, depending on the disposal disposal uh, disposal plant. Uh, also, we made a collaboration with the local authority for waste disposal tracking. I mean, the the the, the kind of journeys that the trucks are, are are doing. I mean, for the time being, was just a way to to raise awareness about this point. But of course, behind this, that could be. I mean, interesting project about how to improve not only the collect but also the the the, the overall. Uh, pipeline. I mean, for 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 waste, and this was a uh, was an artistic installation in the in one of the top museums in Rome. I mean, recently last. I mean, six months ago actually. Um, the very last actually, I just mentioned that this is the adoption of this new IMX five hundred cameras of Sony, which are privacy preserving. 
to be adopted in the city for three kinds of applications. First, I mean, monitoring the, 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 the bus loads, which is a, seems, I mean, an easy, an easy task, but it isn't uh, in Rome, but mm -hmm. also, I mean, looking at parking applications. And what I like most is actually trying to classify crossroads based on the safety level, actually, from the promiscuity between, I mean, weak subject like bikers, pedestrians, and of course, heavy, heavy, heavy transportation loads. Um, yeah, I guess probably I stop here. I mean, also here we try to go for uh, for predictive algorithms in terms of where the bus will come. I mean, what will be the the the, the actual load? I mean, at the moment in which I'd be supposed, I mean, to jump in. Okay, so we try to combine all this, but I stop here because I guess I use even too much time. Thanks. Uh, no, no, that's that's totally fine. Thank you very much. Um, that looks like your last slide anyway. So <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> I think, yes. <laughs> I think that was very good. Thank you. Thank you, Vittorio. I, was, I mean, I guess I stop here. No, it's super interesting. And um, this is exactly what I think you and sure and I were interested in, and this sort of interplay between Hannah's presentation and yours is a really interesting kind of contrast between them. And um, I noticed Hannah just put in the chat about waste and disposal, and I just thought that's an immediate interesting- I really overlap. love waste. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, so tracking, tracking these kind of um patterns of activity and what we think of the end of something or is it the end of something and then it's what we think of the waste what is yeah gummy yeah e exactly mm -hmm. so that, that's definitely something i should pick up in a moment so but let's uh, i'm going to move to rory hide straight away just so that we again um have time for discussion so rory over to you thanks dan um thanks everyone nice to see you all um Really pleased to be here. So I'm Associate Professor in Architecture, Curatorial Design and Practice here at the uni. Um, as I mentioned at the very start, I'm focused on housing, on suburbs, on forms of practice and how to make them more social, more inclusive, more democratic and so on. Um, previous role was in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum, where I was the curator of contemporary architecture. Um, and I guess the, the work that I'm doing now is a real continuation of, of the work that we did there. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about those um, museum projects because they speak to this idea of democracy quite directly. They, they are also very much about culture, which is the big headline um, theme for discussion today. Um, and it's, <coughs> um, I guess, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to sort of pull that line of thinking through. So I'll share my screen. Um, and really, the <clears throat> question I want to ask today, is that, is that working? Doesn't seem to no, it is, it's coming sort of there struggling. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's really struggling. I can try it like this. Just. Yeah, we can see it, but not when you. That's better. Is that better? That's fine. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. you know, border. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, what's a museum for? And it sounds like an easy question. You know, you go in, you buy a ticket, you see an exhibition, you look at pictures hanging on the wall. It's enjoyable. It's like going to a movie. And, you know, obviously, um, I love that kind of ex museum experience. This this image by Thomas Struth is, I think, captures that um, wonderful atmosphere and um, again, inclusivity of the, of the museum. But there's also, I guess, a far more radical role of the museum as a place of social imagination. The museum is a place of prototyping different ways of living together. Um, and I'm gonna focus on that role today. So I'm gonna to talk about a couple of projects of um, my own that I've done with colleagues at the v and and elsewhere, and then also show some examples of other people who are doing it better. Um, like Tanya Bruguera here, whose um, incredible installation at the Tate Modern um, Tatlin's Whisper, which has a real um, police horse in the um, gallery, ordering people around and directing traffic with a um, whistle <coughs> uh, and you know yelling instructions. So quite a confronting different type of experience from this one depicted by Thomas Strew. And it's what Tanya describes as um, art is living the future in the present. So again, the museum is a place where, and art is a place where 
um, we can prototype and imagine and test different ways of relating to each other and of collaborating, cooperating, and um, really living in, in a different way. Um, all of this sits against a backdrop of what's called the ICOM debate. And so this is a real um, internal fight, a soul searching within the major um, institution of museums, which the ICOM is the International Council of Museums. Um, they've been uh, redefining the definition of what a museum is. So on the, on the right here at the top, you can see their old um, definition, which was introduced in 1970. I'll read them out. Sorry, they're quite long quotes, but I think they're useful at getting to this point of the shift in the, in the role of the museum. <clears throat> Museums are non-profit institutions in the service of society. They exhibit the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study and enjoyment. So I think, you know, it sounds pretty agreeable, uh, but of course we want to go further. We want to try and capture this role of the museum as a place of um, social change. So the new proposal from 2020, museums are democratizing inclusive and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about pasts and futures. They work with and for diverse communities and aim to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equity and planetary well-being. So there's some really big ideas here, equity, dignity, justice, equality, planetary well-being, et cetera. And, and this, as I say, caused a huge um, conflict. People were resigning over the idea that this um, definition could go in. And really the, the, the um, point at the center of it all is, um, you know, should is this a declaration of values or is it a definition of what a, what a museum could be? And I think a lot of people think that it, it can be both and it ought to be both. Um, and really it goes back to, I think, the origins of um, public museums as, a, as an idea. So as I mentioned I was at the V&A. This is Henry Cole, who was the first director and the founder of the V&A. He also um, came up with the idea for the first great exhibition. Um, and this lovely quote where he says, the public museum could be a powerful antidote to the gin palace. So instead of getting drunk in the evening, you could um, go to the museum and, and of course he invents um, uh, the first museum with gas lighting, the first museum with a um, restaurant, the first museum with late opening hours, so that you can come here look at the finest things and be improved in this kind of Victorian idea of, um, again, uh, you know, education and um, etiquette and social change. So we were sort of, um, I guess, attracted by some of these themes, but also wanting to engage with them and critique them. This is a project from 2015 that we did um, part of our bigger exhibition of this same name, all of this belongs to you, which we wrote in neon letters in one meter high uh, in the main entrance. And really it was a, a kind of um, reminder of this democratic idea at the heart of the public museum of um, everything that, you know, that is there to be accessed and inclusive and it's for everyone. And we felt that the museum had become kind of stuffy and elite and had lost that origin point of um, what an inclusive and, and what a museum for everyone really means. Um, so another proposal that didn't get up for, as part of the exhibition was to um, turn the museum into a polling station for election day. Um, we got, that was approved, the, the local uh, polling centre were, they, they brought all their stuff in and then somebody measured how far it was from the entrance and it, and it was too far so they had to, they cancelled it like on the day, it was so annoying. This is just Photoshop. But the, at the, the idea really was that you could, you know, cast your vote, put it, put, cross your box, put it into the um, slot underneath these um, Raphael, uh, paintings within the grandest museum. So, you know, some people will vote in their local school or their swimming pool. And then um, some people, if they live nearby, get to vote here in the museum. And it, and it reminds you that these things are kind of the same. They're public buildings, they're um, supported by um, public ideas, they're for everyone. And, they're, and there's no difference really between a local um, school hall and, and the Raphael cartoons. 
some of the other, um, th this exhibition also had a series of installations. This is a, a series of works by the art architecture um, feminist group called Muff, uh, called one, uh, More Than One Fragile Thing at a Time. They were looking at this um, very uh, important, impressive gallery full of, well, mostly Italian sculptures uh, and with daylighting and um, fountains and paving stones. So it's really designed to look like a public space inside the museum. Um, but as they acknowledged, the um, it may be a public space, but it's not actually that welcoming. If you wanted to sit down and stay here and spend some time, you, all you have are, the, are these very hard um, blocks of stone to sit on. So they very simply introduced these cushions that you could lie down on and, and um, uh, they also had to train the gallery staff to be unjudgmental. <laughs> it's okay to sit there and fall asleep. It's okay to sit down and look on your phone. Yes, we encourage you to, you know, sketch the sculptures, but it's also where you can like take a load off and plan your next trip if you've been walking across town to try and get to the museum. Another installation they made was started with this work, which is, hang, which is hanging on the wall in the museum. Um, that is a, an incredible, huge sculpture, three meters tall of a Madonna holding open her cloak. And you can see underneath sheltering people. Um, it was on this um, charity, a, a church and a school in Venice. Um, and uh, where it was a kind of sign that said, this is a place where you can come and seek help. You can, you'll be cared for. You, we will come inside and we'll hold our cloak over you and look after you. Um, of course, that uh, in the 19th century, Britain um, buys this uh, sculpture from Italy, chips it off, puts, sails it across the channel and hangs it up in the museum. But when it's transferred to the museum, that um, promise of care is lost. It becomes an artwork rather than an invitation. Um, uh, so Muff sought to, I guess, um, re-establish that promise, not by returning the object back to Italy, but by bringing that promise from Italy into the gallery, what they called reverse restitution. So instead of returning the artwork, they, they ret return the promise. Um, as part of that, they, they invited a um, charity called Women for Refugee Women to set up their um, organisation within the gallery. And this is a place where they were then offering language lessons, um, tours of the museum, um, advice on housing, and then advocating also for the, um, for the uh, issues which they believed in, in the, which they were campaigning on rather, um, such as uh, for women to be um, not kept in detention while their um, applications for uh, asylum are being processed and so on. So, so there was a sort of opportunity then for them to, to use the museum as their platform for their um, campaign as well. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this for our Italian colleagues. So they also, uh, Muff also invited the um, local community groups, and I, I believe this is the local Italian pensioners choir who came to sing in the gallery <laughs> on a Wednesday afternoon um, and filling the halls with their beautiful sounds. Um, I'll go a, a bit quicker, Dan, I have no idea how, when, what time I started. Um, <laughs> We also did some smaller things related to the street. So in this image, you can see this is a um, standard um, security bollard, which we introduced into the metalwork gallery of the museum. And we also brought in these, um, what's called architectural spikes. It's actually an anti-homeless spike. So I sort of um, like those spikes to keep birds off fences, but for people. Um, and we just put these very discreetly within the museum so that it looked like we were kind of stopping people from sitting there, but they were really an object on display. How, how long do I have? You've been going about uh, 13 minutes. Okay, okay, good. Um, so I'll just, uh, I guess, touch on some of the bigger themes then rather than going into detail. Um, 
another work with Natalie Jeremajenko, which was about bringing ecology into the museum. So looking at it, questioning this idea that it is a hermetic air conditioned sealed place and trying to connect it to the um, bees and other species that exist around the museum. She created a garden for moths in the, in the courtyard. Uh, and uh, this is, requires more time, but we also interviewed Julian Assange as part of this project um, while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy. And, and I like this quote because it gets to this point of um, blurring boundaries and extending things. A lot of serious political activists are migrating from calling themselves journalists or documentary makers to calling themselves artists simply because of the encroaching constraints. So again, um, you know, where can you seek that and find that fluidity uh, and break those boundaries as well? A few other examples of, as I say, other people doing it better. This is Art on the Underground, which I think is an incredible institution that um, introduces art into very public spaces like train stations and um, bus shelters. And uh, this is Laura Provost's uh, take on Brexit. You are going in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this wonderful project by Steve McQueen, where he photographed um, every class in the whole of London in year three. I think there's um, 7,000 photographs in this series, and, and each one was put on a billboard around the city. Um, and there was also an ex exhibition in, in Tate Modern, and what he described as a visual portrait of citizenship. I'll, I'll just come to the close then with a few final projects. Brooklyn Art Museum's Project Reset, which um, is a collaboration with the Centre for Court Innovation, allows young people who've committed minor infractions to uh, clear their criminal records by taking classes in the museum. So a, this is the museum operating in a much more proactive social and um, engaged role. Alice Proctor does what she calls uncomfortable art tours. So these are unsanctioned tours of museums where she highlights the um, contested colonial uh, and racist histories of collections. Um, I'll skip over the quote in the interest of time, but it's um, yeah, really about confronting those the, um, truths and, uh, which are brushed under the carpet within these big institutions, particularly to do with colonialism. Um, and then I've just put this in actually after watching your um, presentation, Hannah, which is the Victorian Aboriginal Funeral Service, HEARSE. So this is what I would call an example of a, um, of a living object. So this is the um, 1960s uh, Charger, I think, um, Challenger HEARSE, which was um, belonged to the Victorian Aboriginal Funeral Service. Um, it was then acquired by the Melbourne Museum in the 80s, and it's been sitting there for, you know, 40 years. Uh, it was recently requested by the Aboriginal Service, um, to, for, because it's a very significant vehicle to them, for the return of um, Mungo Man, Mungo Woman. So there's an um, ancient uh, people discovered in Northern Victoria. Um, and, uh, and so the museum, you know, took it off the shelf, as it were, um, completely re rebuilt the engine, um, new tyres, did the whole lot. So, so sort of, you know, very much hands-on with this um, collection item and then has had, loans it now for significant um, funerals for um, Indigenous people in Melbourne. Archie Roach uh, also was um, transported in this, in this vehicle. So again, you know, rethinking, that, like again, a museum reaching out beyond its borders and engaging with, with real um, practices of everyday life, if mm. you like. Um, and then, so this is really the conclusion is, is how can we learn from First Nations practices and ways of thinking about objects and knowledge as a, as a, as a pointing towards a different kind of museum, a different kind of future. Sarah Lynn Rees, Nawi Carolyn Briggs. Um, this project is, is an exhibition of, of materials from country. And I wanted to finish with this um, wonderful quote from Margot Neal, who's the um, Indigenous curator at the National Museum of Australia. She says, song lines are foundational to our being, to what we know, how we know it, and when we know it. They are our knowledge system, our library, our archive, from which all subjects are derived. So we have this very short history of the museum, which I've given, which starts in 1850, 
but actually this idea of, of, the, of the place, of a knowledge system, of a library, of an archive, these are things which we think of as museums, you know, that's a, that's a practice that's embedded in this place and is carried by First Nations people. So I think if we can um, break those boundaries down between what is considered a, um, a, a, you know, a formal institution and actually these practices of everyday life, um, and we can learn from these types of ways of thinking and practices, then we ought to um, be able to build a new kind of culture that's very um, particular to this place and, and relevant. Thanks. Thank you, Rory. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you. So, I mean, yeah, and thanks, Hannah, for popping things in the chat there about some of the emerging threads and connections. I have a notebook which is like full of big swiggles <laughs> like this, basically. Um, uh, there's a big circle emerging which has VL plus HG plus RH, which is Vittorio plus Hannah plus Rory around um, waste tracking and the end of life and uh, the Serenin and Reese piece that you mm. described at the end there, Rory, I think is about the material cultures, isn't it? It's where mm. the materials come from that can, we construct the world with. And I guess also where they might go back to is then part of that question. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of interesting threads emerging. I promise an intermission, I don't think we're going to get it, <laughs> if that's all right. If we just, uh, we have about 20 minutes um, for discussion now, if that's okay. If you please, uh, of course, stretch your legs if you want to, or nip to the bathroom as you see fit. But I, I suggest if we just um, go straight into a discussion now, or any questions or thoughts or clarifications uh, for the last 20 minutes or so, that'd be, that'd be great. So um, you, Chiro, you, you went first and then you, you've mm -hmm. been listening very carefully then to these uh, <laughs> yeah. the three presentations. Uh, well, I guess mine as well, but also, you know, Vittorio and Hannah and Rory. Um, do you have any uh, questions you want to ask or observations or just what was interesting to you in particular? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we did cover a lot of ground. I mean, it's a very diverse <laughs> presentation. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I, I was interested in. I, I was like, uh, actually, I, I started doing like uh, researching HCI, you know, like in computer science. So I was really like interested when like, like Hannah was talking about these like uh, rich, ritual um, technologies. And, uh, you know, it seems like the, uh, the design criteria is completely different from where you're like, a, you know, like uh, designing something practical, like you can care about usability and, uh, but like, uh, what, what is the difference between, so, so, you know, like, uh, I don't know anything about Buddhism. I just happen to be Japanese, but I don't have any <laughs> knowledge. And, but, you know, if you go to any, any house, like if you go to any, like my, my parents' house, for example, they always have this butsuzang, right? Like, like altars, like small altars to worship the, uh, the dead. And uh, these things are, you know, you can like uh, think of these as interfaces, right? Interfaces or like uh, to worship the dead. And, but, uh, so in that sense, you know, like, uh, yeah, I, I, I like, what's the problem with like replacing this with a more, more high-tech interface, but probably there is some like a uh, design factor, like uh, some designs <clears throat> will be accepted by these like uh, like Buddhist people and some, some like, uh, I don't know, some designs will be just be maybe mm. too much. And uh, what is the, what is the criteria there? Like uh, it, it's completely different. It seems completely different from what the, the, the kind of criteria that you use to create like a consumer product, you know, yeah. like, uh, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm not Buddhist, but I just happen to be Japanese. Might sum up most of Japanese religion, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, a few things. I think the question of like when you mentioned like practicality or usability, I mean, I think in many ways rituals are defined by being slightly impractical, right? There's mm -hmm. an element and like a lot of religion is around this, right? There's an element that something needs to be hard or challenging or sacrifice as, as part of its kind of essential element like it's it's defined by not being the easiest way to do it right and mm -hmm. so when we're doing this work about you know for example like trying to think about how you transform a buddhist altar in someone's home mm -hmm. into a shared altar that has a digital interface for example one of the things we talk about is um multimedia but also multi-sensory and the important of the senses the senses and sensory experience to creating ritual experience and like giving people something to do so it's an interactivity that also kind of reproduces many of the similar channels so um we've been doing a lot of work particularly around like 
smell because smell is so importantly linked to the ancestors, to dead, to memory. Often when I talk to Japanese people, it's like, well, I don't really know what Buddhism or Butsudan is about, but I remember my grandmother burning incense, right? Mm. And so like smell of incense is the most important thing, but then how do we make that a kind of digital interface? How do we reproduce that? Can you reproduce that if it's mm -hmm. tangible? So yeah, I think it's getting away from things that are practical and usable and more about what is the kind of the culturally sensitive, the religiously sensitive interface mm -hmm. It gives mm -hmm. that meaning and it doesn't have to be 100% reproducing it. It could be twisting it in a way or extending it in a way. There yeah. are things that you can do in the digital space that you can't do offline and sometimes they produce better, more interesting religious experiences or better community experiences, broadening it out from religion mm. than mm. the analogue models. Mm. So, yeah, I don't know if that's... <clears throat> Uh, super interesting. And I, I wonder if um, one thing that, you know, is really interesting about the presentations here is I think Rory and, and Hannah, and I think you, Chiro, you also talked about this, these kind of quite intangible, complex, cultural, relational uh, characteristics of cities and communities and lives and habits and rituals. Mm. And, then, and then Vittorio, I mean, uh, um, a lot of your work, as you said, you started off kind of hovering above the city at the kind of aggregate level, but you you did also start getting down into the, the ground when you said, uh, ultimately you ended on uh, the cameras at the level of streets and so on. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if, um, you know, as we know, as we all know here, like one of the critiques of the smart city movement in the past or like um, data-led explorations of cities has been that it tends to look at the data for the, the easy things, like a moving metro train and maybe the hard things like as, Hannah implied like the, the smell of incense um, around a ritual is not <clears> something <throat> that we tend to gather data for or to research, except anthropologists do, but they, they don't end up in the models. And so I wonder if there's any kind of um, reactions that you have or insights or thoughts or half-formed ideas about um, the, the amazing kind of complexity science that you can bring in the modeling, could that work for relational characteristics, not just the objects, but the relationships between things and some of these more intangible questions around cities? Um, so first of all, actually, I, I marked down a certain number of things that struck me. Mm. Uh, actually, there are three main things, actually, which could be perhaps, I mean, three threads, I mean, for future collaboration. And I confirmed them I in what I said yesterday. I guess we need another session yes. to, 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 <laughs> to work it out, everything. But just, I mean, at the level of keywords, I mean, you mentioned already waste. And I guess, I mean, this is already something which could be quite interesting. Um, I was also struck by what you said. I mean, this interplay between participation and representation, okay? Because uh, um, it's not so easy to get the kind of data that we get. It's definitely almost impossible to get the kind of data we wish to have right now to, to track the intangibles, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess this could bring together, I mean, the activity that uh, UICHIRA is already doing and you all are already doing in terms of uh, local participation, engaging local communities with the mapping, with the mapping tools. Mm -hmm. Because this, I mean, if you, if you actually have a restitution, I mean, to people of something which is meaningless to them, they could be willing, I mean, to share I mean, their experience has also the kind of values they have, I mean, respect to their environment. So, I mean, it would be interesting to run the first uh, pilot or POC in a specific area about specific uh, topic. We, we can identify, I mean, different topics, I mean, for this. Um, already at the level of POIs, I mean, there is a lot to be collected because POIs are sort of anodine for a time being. I mean, they're sort of meaningless. I mean, we know that this is a restaurant, but then, okay. Who knows? I mean, what else is there? Yeah. Um, and of course, cemeteries could be could be one element, and uh, and tracking. I mean, the movements of uh, people who are not supposed to move in the first place, but then still <laughs> they move like like trees. I mean, like uh, like paintings. Okay, so there is a life for this kind of. Uh, Okay, I wouldn't say object, but okay. Mm. Uh, okay, this 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 entities. Okay, mm. uh, and the third element which struck me is uh, museums, uh, because we've been thinking. Actually, I was part of a, a committee recently about how to democratize museums, in the sense not attracting people in the museum, 
uh, making sure that actually whatever is produced at the museum level can actually be somehow, uh, I don't know, used and and uh, and exploited also very far from the museum. So your regions in which there is nothing actually, and the kind of POIs are not there, okay? So I'm thinking about whether we can think about something like a diffused entity for a museum in which uh, the museum could be a local production uh, center, but not mm -hmm. only actually, because you can have a local production centers. I mean, I like the idea of the ballot in the, mm. in the museum, because for instance, we thought a lot about using libraries mm. as production centers, because libraries are more capillary on the on the on the territory. Mm. Um, so mm. I mean, for the timing, I mean, top of my head, I, I see these three super things. interesting. And yeah. So mu museums, uh, participation and, and mapping and, and waste. Then, of yeah. course, we need more time I mean, to 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 figure out I mean, how to, to proceed. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it might be that we, um, after this session, uh, thoughts will keep on occurring, I'm sure. So, so I think we will do a summary after this and, and share something between us. And then, as you said, um, Yoshira and I would love to bring us together in numerous ways um, to develop the ideas. But there's something really, um, there's, a, there's some themes emerging here then around a kind of a distributed or you said diffuse then approach to some infrastructures in the past which have been in the 20th century at least were maybe more centralized so we would call it a large cemetery or a large uh, cremation crematorium um, whereas in the past I guess um, you would know better Hannah but uh, disposal of bodies and burial and funerary traditions were pretty more distributed and localized to some degree and then of course 20th century comes along with its technologies of centralization and we tend to then move in that direction. I know where I used to live in Stockholm, you know, those large cemeteries all came in in the 1920s and mm. part of the technology of the time actually of just disposing of bodies, but they became a different thing at that scale. Well, they became the necropolis, right? Yeah. The city of the dead, as opposed to the... Exactly. And I guess also museums, as you pointed out, Rory, they sort of have a relatively recent history in a way as a, as a, mm. as a large physical institution and a, a centralizing function but you as you pointed out then Vittorio uh, there's an interesting now pull uh, in the other direction to say how does the museum turn itself inside out and connect to its neighborhood in numerous ways at, at street level at, in the in the bakery and so on so like a uh, flipping itself inside out like that the, that distributed mm. an intimate sense is really a powerful theme we could work with um and there's, there's so many parallels between I mean, in in my mind, they're almost like very similar things. The cemeteries and museums, like as as kind of institutions, as technologies, kind of mm. ruled by this cons conservation drive, right? Of yeah. like that which has valued it, that which we want to hold on to, that which is sacred, secular, sacred in some way, and then both having movements to kind of distribute them throughout the city, but also to transform them into different kinds of public service and space, mm. right? You know, can a museum also be something else? Can it be, you know, education? Can it be teaching? Can it be activism yeah. outreach? You know, can cemeteries be parks? Can they be, can cemeteries be parks? Can they be sites for, you know, education? Can they be, you know, ghost tours? Can they be whatever it is you know, in Japan? You know, there are many other different things, you know. And then I just think that's really interesting parallels, but when you step back a level, it's kind of the similar questions about, you know, what we value, who values it, and then where we locate those centers of value, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're also kind of um, held back by their traditions in a yeah. way. <laughs> like, well, and they're multiple publics. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, this is how we've always done it, all these buildings, which are so sort of grand and established that we, mm -hmm. we can't change it, that our practices, we can't think, imagine how to reinvent them. And I guess cemeteries are a bit the same, you know a digital shrine is somehow sacrilegious <laughs> well it is about the sacred right even yeah, museums yeah. are about like you know da vinci etc these are the kind of gods of western civilization or whatever you know like yeah, that's the, exactly yeah yeah, yeah that, there's um there's a, an interesting question i also had about value i think victoria a lot of your what was trying to listen the value and i see you just put something in the chat about that as well which i'm capturing in a text file um values and mm. value uh, uh two slightly different variations on a very similar word in english mm. at least but um 
the value of, of something. I know, as you, I know Carlos Moreno um, a little bit, as, as I know you do with your 15 minute city stuff and um, picking up something Hannah wrote in the chat earlier, I think uh, they've started shifting this from Paris, at least the idea of what's important, what, what, who defines what a point of interest is and where, it, where it's located. And so the idea that it shouldn't just be about, um, can I get to an employment center or can I get to a hospital? But am I close to a bakery that makes fresh bread? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, can I get there within 15 minutes walk? That's equally, if not more important, depending on the context, right? And so, so I sort of slightly building this on what Hannah and Rory were just saying, who decides what's important? Um, and can we maybe, could we explore perhaps like a bottom up idea or a distributed idea of what a community decides is important? That very much links to Yuichiro's starting mm. point of his Wikitopia project. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd be fascinating in finding a way of like combining the kind of grounded emic anthropological, like finding what the values are, like if it's sensory, if it's a place or that, and then combining that with the kind of data driven model of then mm -hmm. can we then do a comparative approach to looking at that, like judging cities on their own terms. Yeah. Right. Like mm -hmm. instead of like this is the top 10 for every city. It's like, well, the people who live in that city get to determine what the top 10 is for them, right? Like, what are the yeah. data points that they want to be judged on, right? And it might be in Rome, it might be big cultural stereotypes coming. It might be like fresh pasta, <laughs> fresh bread. And, you know, in Japan, it might be, you know, where is the good izakaya down the street? It might be whatever it is in, you know, Melbourne. They are the points at which we can yeah. determine those kind of things, maybe. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It could be done. If it could be done. Melbourne is fresh pasta and izakaya. <laughs> yeah. And flat white. That's a really good <laughs> coffee. Flat <laughs> white. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so what do you reckon, Vittorio, about the idea of um, you know, opening the box marked value or values and having that kind of very distributed idea, almost like um, yeah, bottom-up emergent or complex idea about what a what a community values. Uh, and therefore, what are the kind of concentrations of those things? They might turn into things like libraries or crematoria, or it might be a, the smell of a bakery or something. But mm -hmm. yeah, I guess the, I guess this could be a changing element. I mean, for the interaction between the, 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 the let's say also the policymakers and the stakeholders and and people, because people are so bored with so many requests about okay, share me. Share with me your GPS tracks. I mean, or tell me, I mean, what is your favorite place? Okay, so they're so fed up with this. So I guess if we really touch, I mean, the actual values that we give meaning, I mean, to what they do, I guess it could change, I mean, this kind of interaction. So I guess engaging with communities would be, would be much more, I mean, effective in this sense. Mm -hmm for, I mean, research purposes, but mainly for the communities actually. So to empower the communities with tools to decide about their environment and their values after all. So, um, so I, I I can see already a couple of directions we could uh, we could uh, we could take for this. Of course, I mean it's still foggy, uh, yeah. but uh, but I guess it wouldn't be difficult to identify. I mean, one or two POCs. I mean, to run somewhere or perhaps mm -hmm. in parallel in different communities, in different areas. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so maybe another angle on this, uh, and as you said, it's okay to be foggy right now because um, <laughs> we're in the middle of it um, and we're moving through it um, and we have to stop in about five minutes. <laughs> so then the fog must clear. But I think uh, there's something interesting and then about the sort of the multiple histories or, you know, what can't be seen. I can always listening to you, Ichiro, about his... His, his work there around the stories in, in cities and what this place used to be, and now it's a laundrette. Previously, it was a bakery. And we're going to, you know, Japanese cities has this incredible metabolism and dynamism mm. often to them. But then at the same time, you have all of these layers of history, whether it's spirits or animism or kami or, you know, like uh, everything has ghosts. <laughs> and that, of course, that also has the case in uh, so called Western and Northern civilizations as well. It's just sometimes we've sort of, um, tidied those away into institutions like the museum, which has decided what are the important mm -hmm. stories to tell about that thing. And, and what I love about that, which you showed about taking the stone from Venice yeah. and then kind of reanimating it with its original, one of mm -hmm. its original meanings. Mm -hmm. And so 
I wonder if there's also not just a, this is the city now, this is the neighborhood now, this is what's important to us now, but it's kind of we've got all of those latent histories and futures, which can also be parsed and understood and discussed and mm. constructed collectively, I guess. Yeah, that's uh, a, kind of ties with the, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. No, no, you're cheater. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about the distributed museum uh, idea, and uh, I thought that what Dan just said like ties uh, nicely with that idea. What you know, I, I, I went to Rome only once in my life, but I remember like uh, the Rome, uh, you know, the city as a whole, like uh, it's kind of like a museum turned inside out, right? So it, it has all these like, uh, yeah. uh, like beautiful like buildings, old buildings, and sculptures, and, like sculptures that just lying on the street or some, something like that, and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I felt like when I moved from Tokyo to Kyoto, I felt kind of like a similar way. So, you know, in Kyoto, in Tokyo, I, there is history, of course, but it's kind of hidden beneath the surface. But in Kyoto, it's like in your face, you walk around the street and there are all these like old buildings and you have these uh, shops selling these like a traditional crafts and so on. And yeah, I, I was wondering like uh, that. And, you know, it, it kind of re like reminded me how like Tokyo is, a bit barren, like uh, looks a bit barren in that regard. So you have to go to the museum to learn about Tokyo, and mm. uh, yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. I was thinking about like how we can use um, uh, maybe not technology. <laughs> I don't want to. We don't want to use technology for technology's sake, but uh, maybe we can use something like a uh, yeah, like yeah, augmented yeah. reality or yeah to yeah yeah to turn the whole like a city into a kind of a virtual museum and, uh, absolutely and, I, I, and, I really love that sense of i mean it also reminds me that um re, we can read natural landscapes in the same way or rather you know in, in, mm. in from an indigenous perspective as a reading of the landscape mm. which is just as obvious as uh when i <clears throat> rome or kyoto for instance um, but we've lost that capability often as a so-called contemporary society so there's that, that, that kind of ability to see the other meanings in something or to read the systems or to read the patterns, whether they're natural <laughs> patterns or historical ones. It's the emergent Tokyo book that I briefly referred to. It talks about the river systems underneath Tokyo. And, you know, like um, whatever it's called, Mozart and Brahms Alley, or is it Beethoven and Brahms Alley? That, that one in, in Tokyo is, um, has got a river system running along it. And you don't know that at all. So you know, like, that's why this path is there and it's been there forever. And that's why there's no cars in this bit. So, yeah. so yeah, a reading of the city in that way would uncover mm. interesting things. Vittorio, sorry, you were going to say something as well. Yeah, yeah, well, just to increase the entropy and the level of fogginess here, because I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, Anna said co-working and new kind of maps. Actually, I just reminded that actually, I'm trying to put together a new project with my colleagues in Venice, by the way, mm. who are, uh, uh, I mean, behavioral economists, and uh, they're actually running a project about how to uh, uh working while walking or the other way around mm. okay so a new way i mean practically to 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 cancel i mean altogether commuting but saying that whatever you do between place a and place b has the meaning i mean it could be rich also in terms of uh, business mm. production and they are running a certain number of experiments now with people from different companies cisco i guess was the last one they sent something like 40 people in residence, salesmen actually, so not uh, artists. Uh, but they're actually exploiting the, the city in that way. And then with this guy, actually, it's a very interesting guy. We we're discussing about the work of Tim Ingold. Yeah. And the idea yeah. of, yeah, yeah. And the idea that actually the, the actual map that people have in mind is a completely different one with respect to the topographic map. I mean, it's because the map is constructed through the paths okay that you do i mean so we had in mind the idea of constructing this kind of maps by recording the actual traces of uh, of people been shared by people and annotated with values uh, by by people so this could go in uh, in the same somehow in the same direction uh, perhaps venice could be one fantastic venue for, uh, for right, not not co-walking but co-punting down yes <laughs> yes yes this is or this, or just walking. <laughs> yeah, walking. I used to live near Venice, and walking is a is a is a joy and a nightmare. Small <laughs> Also, anyway, very foggy yeah, from time yeah. to time. To build on your theme, uh, Vittorio. So, um, but no, yeah. Tim Ingold is a fantastic reference for us. Actually, for those of the that haven't come across the work, there is really fantastically interesting around walking experience, um, mapping in the broadest sense of the word. And, understanding both natural and cultural landscapes. So super interesting. 
um, um, I think that also um, in these in all these talks, uh, it was coming to my mind that it could be interesting to study uh, dual use uh, uh, POIs or a dual use for streets and stuff. Um, like just recently, just this maybe targeted for Anna. Uh, I was in, on a trip to India and we went to, to a breakfast place that was suggested by the hotel, by the way, and totally an Indian place. You, you, you could only eat uh, uh, spicy food even for breakfast there. Uh, and we entered and we saw that there were uh, some small stones on the, on the floor. And, uh, and some of us said, ah, this looks like a cemetery. And we were just kidding around, like saying, ah, it's impossible. Come on, we are in a breakfast place. Uh, but then we asked, and it was really an old cemetery in which <laughs> they just took the space because they needed the space, you know, that this yeah. ultra density mm -hmm. in, in all of uh, India. So, um, so it was interesting because this evolution of the places uh, uh, given by, of course, by the needs of the, of the citizens, it's something that it's maybe hard to, to understand completely, but it would be cool to study. That's a really nice insight. Mm -hmm. Matteo, thank you, because it's, um, again, it's kind of got this theme about uh, during modernity, we simplified and uh, sort of deleted that complexity and diversity, whereas, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, you would have had a, a home, which would also have been a factory and a workshop and a sense of a waste with multiple families living in it, you know, and, and then we sort of separate with those things out in the 19th and 20th centuries, at least in many bits of the world, not all of them, of course. So it's kind of we still have then these classifications this is either a cafe or it is a cemetery and it can't be both <laughs> but as you point out of course it can and mm. you've, been to, you've been to one right and and i guess i was also showing you know this is a library but it's also kind of the living room for the community and it's also a place of work for some people and for other people it's a it's a place of care and solace that rory pointed about the museum is doing multiple things simultaneously even like a voting booth potentially almost almost <laughs> <laughs> so it's so this is kind of um it's a really different kind of mapping isn't it because in the past the city would have been seen as these these are these very clear objects with boundaries between them and this does this and that does that and the POs POIs would have been studied in that quite reductive way but this conversation at least shows that all of these objects have multiple meanings multiple histories multiple futures and multiple simultaneous presence so it's it's kind of yeah it's um as you said, uh, Victoria, it's increasing the entropy and we're getting foggier, but I think it's getting more, the, the fog is getting thicker and more interesting. <laughs> I can feel it, you know. Um, but on that note, I'm also really conscious of time and, you know, really um, taken a great, it's been a great pleasure, but also a liberty sort of from us to listen to each other and to think and talk together. Um, and as many of us have said, I, I guess I, we all probably feel it, we're just kind of getting going. But uh, at least it might be the beginning of the day in Rome. It's certainly not here in Melbourne, so we have to do. We do have to um, draw it to a close for now. But I think uh, you, Chiro, you and I should maybe check in uh, tomorrow or something while it's fresh in our mm -hmm. heads. If you're around, yeah. and uh, we can plan a kind of follow-up activity because mm. we want to do two more sessions with different people, or other Melbourne Uni mm -hmm. researchers, <clears throat> and um, other folk from the Sony side, and then we'll have like three fogs simultaneously no doubt <laughs> and we'll, but we'll, so we'll need to come together and start pulling this mm. apart and thinking so what are these crossover points and please get back to us Yuichiro and me with any thoughts you have um mm -hmm. whenever overnight tomorrow but we'll get back to you guys about a format that we can come together again because if you're willing I think mm. it'd be fantastic to progress the discussion yeah thank you so much okay. no, yeah it's it's been like a Oh, sorry. Like I, I just bumped into this like a shot. <laughs> <in the water. laughs> yeah. I, like, I, I can feel. Yeah, I can feel that. This is like I, yeah, I can see that this is starting to like take shape somewhat. You know, like it, it could be a start of something kind of very interesting. Really fascinating, guys. Yeah. yeah. Great. Right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thanks Future Hero. No, thanks everybody. Thank you so much, guys. Very awesome. interesting. Yeah, lovely interesting. to meet you and great to uh, talk with you. So we'll talk to you soon. Take Thank care. You. Have a good evening, morning, afternoon. <laughs> yes, I got up some. Yes, bye. -bye. Yes.